Acts chapter 3. We're going to tackle the entire chapter of Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 26 today. And I just want to talk to you really from the simple thought. This is the first miracle of the church, the very first recorded miracle in the church, just by way of like a 45-second introduction. Acts chapter 2, we saw the power of the Holy Spirit fall down upon the church, and the church began, right? Peter stood up, he gave a powerful sermon, 3,000 people got saved, and then at the end of the chapter, we see what the early church did. They fellowshiped, they prayed, they read scripture, they gave their possessions away to the poor and to those in need. This is what the church did. Now, in Acts chapter 3, what we're going to see happen is we're going to see the apostles now begin to apply everything that happened in Acts chapter 2. I mean, it'd be one thing if the apostles were like, hey, you should all, you know, like fellowship together. You know, like koinonia, you should all get together. But if they didn't example that in front of the church, it'd kind of be like a pastor, like today, is talking about don't go get drunk. And then that pastor is like drinking more Captain Morgan than any other person in the church, right? they got to example this in front of the people. From the believers. So Acts chapter 3 through 5, we're now going to see a mighty, powerful application of what God did in Acts chapter 2. All right, that was a little longer than 45 seconds, but let's jump in. Acts chapter 3. I'm going to split this chapter up into a couple different categories, okay? And two different categories. The first category is this. We're going to call this prayer and miracles. We have that on the slide there. Prayer and miracles. Write that down. Take a picture if you need it. We're going to start it here in verse chapter, chapter number, or chapter, verse number one. Prayer and miracles. Now listen, it's almost elementary to say that those two things go together, right? There are just certain things that go together in life, right? Peanut butter and jelly, they go together, right? The grape jelly, not the weird strawberry jam stuff, not that, no. No, no, no. The grape, peanut butter and grape jelly, right? Chips, and salsa, they just go together, right? Do they not? Right? The Chicago Bears and lose it. They just go together. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They just go together. It's 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 almost elementary to say. The, yeah, the, the Cowboys. I mean, the Cowboys are doing well. The Cowboys are doing well. All of a sudden, right? So they just go together. Can I just tell you today? There's a direct connection between you and I seeking God calling on God and praying to God and the miracles that we see happen in our life. There's a direct connection to when we pray. Why is this the case? Because God is a God who answers our prayers. Amen. Can I get a hearty amen? God is a God who answers your prayer. Your prayer doesn't hit the ceiling and come back to you. God is a God who hears your very prayer. The prayers you prayed this morning, the prayers you're going to pray today, the prayers you're going to pray tonight, he hears the prayers, and you were designed to receive an answer from God. There's a direct connection between our prayers and the miracles that we are praying for. So don't stop praying. Don't stop giving up on your spouse. Don't stop giving up on that disease. Don't stop giving up praying for your children. Don't stop praying for our city. Don't stop praying for our country. Don't stop praying because your prayers don't fall deaf at the throne of God. Amen. Verse number one, Acts chapter three says this. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. Hallelujah. This is good all by itself. The prayer service at church. And I just want to say it again. I think what trips a lot of believers up is that we think, you know what? As long as I'm good with God, as long as I'm praying in the morning or at nighttime, I got my personal Bible reading. I'm good between me and God. I think we think that that's it. We're good. But listen, do not discount the power of coming together in the community of believers and believing God for the miracle miraculous things to take place in our life. We're going to see a direct correlation in this chapter between the community of believers calling on God and the miracles that actually take place. I mean, Peter and John, of all people, they could have been like, you know what? I, I walked with Jesus. I, 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 I prayed with Jesus. I learned how to pray from the, the Our Father. Who I like, I learned it all from Jesus. Peter and John could have been like, I don't got to go to prayer meeting. I don't got to go to the three o'clock. I've been there. I've done that. But we see a direct connection between what Jesus does, what God does in the community of believers, and the miracles we're praying for. And I just want to say it again. I cannot emphasize enough the power of our ten o'clock prayer meeting here at church. 
Powerful things are happening in the life. Powerful things will happen in the life of our church as the believers come together and call on God. Peter and John are on their way to the temple. Now, let me just, I want to show you a picture because I think it helps. It helps me to get a visualization of kind of what was happening in Peter and John's day. This is a picture of the temple. This was built by Herod the Great. This was, maybe you've seen a picture like this before. This was a massive engineering feat in biblical antiquity. This would have been the, the size of, of approximately 15 football fields, professional football fields, in length, the massive structure, these stones, I mean, this, and the engineering feat alone of building this temple would have been astounding, especially in biblical times. This is, this is a massive, uh, massive temple. Now, out here at the outer courts here, we have what is called Solomon's Colony. The columns is called Solomon's Colony. This would have been in the Gospels where Jesus went and he overturned the tables of the money changers. This would, this would have been where it all happened, in these columns back here. This big, wide, open area, this is called the Court of the Gentiles. This is where anybody could come into that area. If you were a Jew, if you were a believer, or if you were a non-believer, you could go and you could enter the temple in this big, open area. Now, here in the middle, this is the actual temple Itself, And I want to go, Matt, if we could go to that next diagram. This is actually the middle part. This is where our story today actually takes place, here in the middle part of the temple. Now, we have a couple different gates here. We have the gate leading into that. This would lead into the very open area. That, that part is called the Court of Women. And then you have another gate right over here, the second gate. This leads to the Court of Men. Now, we don't know which gate this story actually takes place at. Here in the middle, back behind this gate right here, this would have been where the sacrifices take place, where the, the priest would go in and they would offer the lamb every single morning. In fact, in fact, can we do this, Matt? Can you go to that next slide? This is not an actual picture because cameras didn't exist back then, but this is a picture of inside where they actually offer the sacrifice. You see the altar of incense there. And what would happen, Matt, can we go back to the previous slide, the diagram? But what happened was, as the sacrifices were offered here, everybody out in the court of Gentiles would wait for the incense to rise. They'd wait for the smoke to rise because that was an indicator that your prayers were being offered to God. Your prayers were ascending to the throne room of God. The priest would offer the sacrifice. The prayers would go to God. And everybody in the temple court, everybody in the court of Gentiles, the court of women, the court of men, everybody would wait for the moment the priest to come out and they pronounce the blessing. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. They'd wait for that moment. Now, if you go back, Matt, can we go back to that slide, the altar of incense? Oh, is that? Altar of incense. Now, yep. So here, this is the veil that would have uh, been torn on the day that Jesus died. Remember, the Bible says that this was the holy of holies, and only the high priest once a year would enter to the holy of holies, and they'd actually enter with bells on, because if you had any sin in your life, as you entered the holy of holies, that priest would drop dead on the spot and then actually tie a rope around their legs and then if they did drop, if they stopped hearing the jingle bells, they'd begin to pull that priest out. This is what happened, right? But that veil was torn on the day Jesus died, unleashing God's presence on the earth, making it possible that there's no longer the court of Gentiles. There's no longer the court of women. There's no longer the court of men. There's no segregation here. There's all are welcome into the courtroom of God. All are welcome into the presence of God. This is where our story today takes place. It happens on the way to prayer meeting. It happens as Peter and John are going into the temple. They're going to come across this guy. They're going to come across this man. Listen, maybe you're thinking, man, I, I kind of remember Peter and John just a few months earlier. They couldn't pray to save their life. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane is like, hey, can you guys pray with me just for an hour? I'm going to go pray. Can you just pray with me? What do they do? They fall asleep. Jesus, on three different occasions, says, wake up. Just pray with me. They couldn't pray for an hour to save their life. And now these men are can't get enough of prayer. Why? Because the Spirit has fallen upon them. Because they are empowered now and they can't get enough prayer. They can't get enough of God. They can't get enough of being with Jesus. Today, maybe you relate with Peter and John. And you say, I can't pray. I pray for two minutes and then I run out of things to say. I don't know what else to pray for. God can change you. God can take you from a person who doesn't pray to a person who can't get enough prayer. This is Peter and John. They're on their way to prayer meeting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They're devoted to prayer. Prayer and there's a direct correlation between the miracles we're praying for and our actual prayer life. And what we see here is a powerful display that as you devote yourself to the discipline of prayer, you become more passionate about it. Ask and you will receive.
receive. Now, here's what I find interesting, and we're going to jump in here. Here's what I find interesting. The first miracle of the church, it happens on the way to prayer meeting. It doesn't even happen in the prayer meeting. It happens on the way to prayer meeting. If you got a miracle you're facing today and you're like, can I just challenge you? This is not biblical. I'm just trying to encourage you today. If you got a miracle you're praying for, just get in your car at 930 on Sunday morning and start driving to prayer meeting and see if God doesn't do a work in your life. There is a powerful connection between our prayer life and the miracles we are praying for. There's a powerful connection. here. Let's give you category number two. Category number two for this chapter is Jesus name and miracles. Jesus name and miracles. Verse number two. As they approached the temple, Peter and John, a man lame from birth was, was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate. So he could beg from people going in to the temple. Can we put that diagram up there one more time, Matt? Again, we've got two gates here. We've got the gate leading into the court of women, and then we've got the gate leading into the court of men, where the temple would be. Now, we don't know which gate this actually took place at, but here's what I would say. Peter and John, I would venture to say, again, we don't know this from Scripture, but I would venture to say Peter and John have probably seen this guy before. He's, that he's put there every single day. We now know Peter and John are men of prayer. We know this. And I would imagine that they have seen this guy before. Now, can we just pause for a moment? Because I think we read this story a little bit too quick at times. Can we pause for a moment and imagine that we are this man? We're a man lame from birth. We're going to see in Acts 4. We know he's 40 years old, 40 plus years old, somewhere in there. So for 40 years, this guy has never walked in his life. Think of your <laughs> life. Think of the things you've done in your life. Think of the places you've walked, the places you've run. Think of the, play, the things you've done with your kids. Think of the athletics you've been a part of. This guy never having done any of that in his life, laying from birth. And every day he is carried to the temple simply to beg from people. His entire source of income is whatever people's leftovers are. His entire source of, of survival is whatever people will give him. And that he's laying from birth, never walked a day in his life. And this is here what we see in verse 3. When Peter and John were about to enter, he asked them for some money. He asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, verse 4. They looked at him intently. And, and that word, that's an interesting word to me. It, it quite literally means like captivated. Um, it, it's the, the idea is, you, you ever, like you, if you're a believer, have you ever have that moment where you know God speaks to you? Like God drops something in your heart. I want you to go and I want you to pray for that person. Or maybe God like, drops someone in your mind to like, um, text them that day. Hey, I'm, I'm thinking of you. I'm praying for you. But you know that moment? This is that moment for Peter and John. They're looking at the man intently. They're captivated because I would suggest to you today that God had that moment in Peter and John's heart where he says, I want to heal this man. And Peter and John, now filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, have that moment of pause. Have that moment of, okay, God, I don't know what you want to do, but I'm available. I'm ready. I'm ready to be the conduit of power through which you bring healing to this man. They have that moment of intently looking the man thought he was going to get some money. Peter and John had no idea what was going to happen, but they're looking intently. They have that moment of awe from God. They have that moment of stop what you're doing because I want to heal this man. They have that moment of waiting, anticipating, and look at what Peter says. Verse 4, he says, look at us. I mean, do you think we got money? Look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly. He's expecting to get the money, for, to get money. Verse 6, what Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you. But I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Get up and walk. How, do, how does the miracle happen? It happens in the name of Jesus, in the powerful name of Jesus. And we're going to read here in verse 16. In fact, let's go to it real quick. Peter's going to explain the miracle later on. He's going to say this. By faith, in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see was made strong. It's in Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that he has been completely healed, as you all can see. There is an important 
recognition here in Peter and John. They are saying it is not by anything we did. Because what's going to happen is a crowd gathers around and they're going to say, Whoa, this man was lame. This man couldn't walk for his entire life. This is the man I gave money to just last week. This man I just gave money to and now he's running around. There's a crowd gathering around and Peter and John say, No, no, no. It is not anything we did. It's only in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. The name above every other name. The name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory. It's in his name. The power that comes from his name. And I almost see Peter and John remembering back to the night Jesus was betrayed. I, rem- I, I can almost see them going back to that moment. Because remember in the garden, Jesus gathers the disciples and he has a conversation with them. And he says, you can ask. I want to read it to you. John chapter 14. John chapter 14 verses 12 through 14. Jesus says this to his disciples. He gathers them around and he says, I want you to pay attention. These are almost my final words. You need to pay attention to what I say. And Peter and John remembering that night, he says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. What had Jesus been doing? He was preaching. He was healing. He was casting out demons. He was raising the dead. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Do you see the progression of power in the life of the believer? You can't do even greater things until you've done what Jesus has done. There's a power, there's a powerful progression that happens in the life of every believer. You will do even greater things than Jesus did. As a church, we will do greater things. We're in the infancy of what God is doing in this church. We will do even greater things, even greater things. And Jesus says this in verse 13, I will do, pay attention to this. This is so important. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And Jesus is like, and just in case you missed what I said, I'm going to say it again. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Thank you, Father. Did you know that there's nothing in all of Scripture that qualifies that statement? There's nowhere in scripture that people are like, you know what? I know Jesus, he said that, but here's really what it meant. And here's what the Greek translates. There's nowhere in scripture that it's like those pharmaceutical commercials. Take this pill and your disease will be gone. You may get insomnia and you may get diarrhea and you may lose your wife and your dog and your health and your life. But take this. It's not like that. There's no qualification for this in scripture. There's nothing safe about this statement of our Lord. There's nothing safe about this is bold. This is a radical statement. We pray to the Father and we pray in the mighty name of Jesus and we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit all of God doing all that God does you may ask me for anything in the powerful name of Jesus and I will do it do you believe this do you believe this today and if your answer is no my question is why why don't you believe it because Jesus said it from his mouth could it be that our theology is being shaped and formed by doubt by discouragement and by dead faith rather than the words of Jesus. John 14, 15, and 16 are all part of one conversation. I want to jump to John 16, but we'll have it on the screen. Jesus says this, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive. Ask, and you will receive, ask, yes, and you God. will receive, yes, and your joy will be complete. It couldn't be more simple. It couldn't be more basic. It couldn't be less complicated. Ask, and you will receive. Can I tell you today, you were designed, our relationship with God was designed to receive from God. You were designed for answer prayers. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. I am not preaching a prosperity gospel to you today. I'm preaching the words of the mouth of our Lord. Ask and you will re- ask in my name and you will receive. I think the re- look at this. What, what, what does he say? And look at it. Your joy will be complete. Your joy will be complete. Why are so many Christians lacking joy? It's because they don't have answered prayers. Why don't they have answered prayers? Because you never asked. 
You never asked in my name, and your joy will be complete. It's in Jesus' name, and the power that comes from his name. It's not because of our godliness. It's not because we're really crushing our Bible reading today. It's not because it's only by the power of Jesus' name. Ask anything in my name, and you will receive what you ask me for today. What are you praying for today? Ask anything in my name, and I will do it so that the Father may be glorified. Amen. Yes, let me just add this to our conversation today, because I think it's important that not only are we praying for our needs, right? That, that's an important part of the believer's life, but we also pray for the needs of other people. And I think it's important that as we pray for the needs of our brothers and our sisters represented in the church, that we, this is just me personally, I think it's important that I, I try not to know a lot of the details going into a prayer request. I come to me, Pastor, here's what's going on in my life. I've got this going on. I've got that going on. And my, my response, you know, oftentimes I get the details, but I try not to know a lot of those details because I don't want to be overwhelmed with the doctor said this and here's the facts and here. No, no, no. I want my faith to be to be so it to be so in tune with Jesus that I can ask anything in Jesus name and it will be done. I, I want I want my faith to be so uh, captivated by like I, I want this to be done in my life. You can ask anything in my name and I will do anything. Anything in my name and I will do it. You say, Pastor, maybe you're saying you're, you're advocating for some kind of nutty things right now. You're advocating for some people to do some crazy, weird things. Like, I grew up in that church. I grew up in the nutty church. I grew up in the Holy Spirit. People throwing tambourines in the name of the Holy Spirit like a Frisbee. That's the church I grew up in. You're advocating for people doing some weird and nutty things. Listen, here's where I'm at. Let me just tell you where I'm at on that. I'd rather a church filled with people full of faith to do something than a church filled with people who do nothing. I'd rather people get it wrong, and we got to go back and maybe have a conversation because you had faith enough to do something rather than faith enough to do absolutely nothing. I mean, is what you come up with going to be bolder and going to be crazier than standing in front of a tomb and saying, Lazarus, come on out. Is it going to be crazier? than No, no, no. It's not going to be crazy. Step out in boldness. No, no, no. Step out in Jesus' name and do something powerful in Jesus' name. As you're praying for the for the needs of other people, step out in Jesus' name. As we lay hands on people and pray for them, step out in Jesus' name. You are a conduit of God's power. You are a conduit of God's power. Let me illustrate it to you this way. I often get this call or this conversation. Pastor, I've got a need in my life. The need is financial. It's X amount of dollars. Otherwise, I'm going to have foreclosure and the bank's going to call and lawyers and I may lose everything. I get that kind of a call. What often happens, I pray, I go to God. And what happens in the life of the church, in the body of believers, somebody else in the body is going to come to me and say, Pastor, I feel like God has dropped this person in my heart. I feel like I need to write them a check in the amount of X amount of dollars. Here's what I get the joy of doing. I get the joy of just simply handing them the check. Because that person says, I want them to receive this blessing, but I don't want them to know it came from me. I get the joy of just handing them that check. I am the conduit. I didn't generate the funds. I didn't pay for the funds. I didn't do anything. I get the joy of handing the check to the person and saying, be blessed. May your joy be complete. God has heard your prayer. I'm just simply the conduit. I'm the person who got the check. I'm the person who now hands the check. I am the conduit of God's power. This is how it works in your prayer life. This is how it works as you pray for the needs. Today, as we pray for the needs of people in our church, you are the conduit of God's power. You reach up and you receive that power. That power flows through you to that person. Don't allow faith, your, the lack of faith. No, no, no. You are the conduit of God's holy power. This is how it works. Let's go back to Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Peter said this. I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, Nazarene, get up and walk. Now, practically speaking, if I can stop yelling for a moment. <laughs> practically speaking, when we when we go to God, I, I, I'm guilty of this, and I'm sure that we all are guilty of this. We pray prayers that sound something like this. Lord. I thank you for your goodness. And I pray today that if it be your will, and Lord, if you'd so be inclined to hear my prayer today, I'm just praying, I'm asking God that you would do this in the name of Jesus. And we make a request before God. But practically speaking, in the Bible, when we read through the Gospels, rarely do we see a prayer like that. More often what we see is, in the name of Jesus, let it be done. And 
the name of Jesus, may it be so. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. In the name of Jesus, provide. In the name of Jesus, healing. In the name of Jesus, there is this maturity that comes as you were in the presence of God. Here's what happens. As you are more in the presence of God, you become more aware of the things that are not of the presence of God that you can command to change in the name of Jesus. I'm not suggesting that you walk around commanding everything, but I am suggesting that as you are more with God, God is more with you. As you are more with God, you may be praying for healing over someone, and you may begin to recognize in your spirit the disease that they are dealing with may not be, it may be from an evil spirit, and you can command that evil spirit in Jesus' name to leave and to change and to bring healing in that person immediately in Jesus' name. As you're more with God, he is more with you, and you become more aware of the things that are not of God. I'm going to give you a terrible illustration, but it illustrates the point powerfully. I grew up, there were five of us siblings. We had a code amongst the siblings. If you were ever facing anything in your life that you needed you needed backup with, we were there no matter what. I didn't have to agree with it. I didn't have to know all the details. I just needed to know, you need my, you, I got your back. You need my help? I got your back. The whole thing, right? So my brother calls me one day. He's probably in junior high. I didn't go to the high school. I'm older than he was. And he, he calls me. He says, David, here's the, here's the deal. I've got these two guys or two or three guys. I can't remember what it was. Two or three guys. I'm in trouble with them. And they've asked me to meet them behind Permenter Middle School in Seattle yeah. Hill, Texas. And he says, I need, I need your help. I need your back. I didn't care about the details. I didn't care what he was in trouble for. I didn't care why they wanted to beat him. I just knew he needed my help. He called me, and I was going to be there. What happened? I show up, and we put a good old-fashioned Texas whooping on those boys. And here's why I tell you that story. Because it did. I, I had been with my brother long enough. I had been around him long enough that he knew he could call me at a moment's notice, and I'd be, I'd drop everything, and I'd be there to put a Texas whooping on those boys. He knew that beyond a shot of a doubt. This is how it works in your relationship with God. Are you so in love? Are you so much in the presence of God that you know when things are not of God and you can begin to call those things and command those things to change in Jesus' name? In Jesus' name. In Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus. Get up and walk. This is how it works in your prayer life. This is how it works that you are able to command things to change when you know that they are not of the presence of God. And it requires that you work of God more and more and more so that you are aware of the things that are not of God. Amen? Amen. I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Would you notice, just real briefly, that the man didn't get up. <laughs> Peter said, get up. In the name of Jesus, get up. The man did not get up. And all the skeptics are going to say, see, I mean, like, right, like if God really healed him, then he didn't need any help to get up. He doesn't, he doesn't need anybody to grab his hand and to help him up. He does if God really did a work in his life, then he doesn't need anybody. Like, that, that's it. Like, God did it. That's it. Verse 7. Then Peter took the layman by the right hand and he helped him up. Wait, wait, wait. Time out. Time out. Because if God really healed the lame man, Peter doesn't got to reach down and grab the dude's hand and help him up. That doesn't got to be, that, that, that's not how it has to happen. That's not how it happens. God healed him. And so it's got to be, it's got to be like, he doesn't need any help whatsoever. If God really healed him, he didn't need any help at all. And this is often said by people who have confined God to a narrow box of this is how God moves, when God moves. Can I just tell you this today? Run from the people who got the diagram plan of how God moved when he moved. Run from those people because God's going to surprise you on more than one occasion. God is going to wreck your expectations on more than one occasion. God is going to do some crazy things on more than one. He'll never confine God to the box that we have designed for him. Verse 7. And as Peter, Peter reaches down, takes the man by the hand and helped him up. And as he did, and as he did, the man's feet and the man's ankles were instantly healed and were strengthened. When did the healing happen? It happened as Peter reached down and he helped the man up. 40 years. I can almost see it happening. Peter's reaching down. He says, get up and walk. Peter grabs the dude by the hand, starts to help him up. He says, wait, 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 wait. I've never walked. I don't got the legs. I don't got the muscles. I don't got anything to help me stand. And Peter, as he, as he lifts him up, 
He began, his ankles were strengthened, his legs were strengthened, his quadriceps were strengthened, his hamstrings were strengthened, giving him the ability to run and to jump. Verse 8, he jumped up. He jumped up. He stood on his feet and he began to walk, then walking and leaping and praising God. He went into the temple with them and all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. I mean, they're thinking, I just gave this guy money. I just gave him money a week ago and now he's the guy running around praising God. Verse 10, when they realized he was the lame beggar they had so often seen at the, at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely Absolutely blown away. And all the people who are running out to the temple, Peter, we're not going to read the whole chapter. Peter goes out and he preaches a sermon. And he says, basically, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, people can say. And this proves a powerful point that the miracles that happen in your life, the miracles that you are praying for today, the signs and the wonders, the healing that you are needing today, the restoration that you are needing today, when God actually does the miracle in your life, those signs, those wonders, those miracles are done to point people to the Savior. Because this crowd all runs out to the temple and they all say, did you see what happened to the lame man? Did you see what happened to the guy who had never walked for 40 years? God healed him. It wasn't Peter and John. It was in the name of Jesus that this man got up and he walked. All the miracles that happened in your life, the miracles are still available today. The power is still available today. The signs and the wonders that we pray for are still available today. Healing is still available today. Restoration is still available today. And all of these things happen to point people to the Savior. Today, if you're a believer in the room, these miracles still happen to keep you in awe of the Savior. Today, if you're, a, if you're not a believer in the room, these miracles happen to bring about the greatest miracle in your life, and that is the Savior. Amen. Redeeming you. The miracles happen still to this day. I'm simply saying that God does miracles in our life to bring people to Him. God wants to heal you. God wants to restore you. God wants to deliver you. God wants that baby to grow and be healthy again. God wants that man to be off the respirator. God wants to heal you from cancer. God wants to heal on his husband Tony from cancer. God wants to direct. God wants to bring wisdom to you. The miracles that happen happen to point people to the Savior. Amen.